Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, let's get started. My name is uh, Helsi Torres Oviedo. I am assistant professor in Pittsburgh at the University of Pittsburgh, and I'm going to be sharing sharing this session. So, I think the rules are very simple. It's five minute talk, so I'm going to try to like keep you guys on track. Okay. Okay. So. So my name is Jared Markowitz. I'm a grad student at uh, MIT working in Dewhurst Biomechatronics Group. And today I'll be talking to you about a data-driven neuromuscular model of walking. So there's a lot of talks at this conference, and for good reason, about the mechanical aspects of walking. And, sorry. And uh, replicating the behavior of normal human gait from a mechanical standpoint. It would be nice, obviously, to look under the hood a little bit and figure out what's going on from a neural perspective, from a muscular control perspective, and that's what uh, this project tries to get at. So one way to do that is to look at the hierarchy uh, shown on the right side of the slide. So uh, obviously you have the neural controller, which is the central nervous system. There's feedforward, there's feedback, which are reflexes. There are the muscle actuators. There's the transmission to the skeleton through the tendons, and then there's the interaction of the skeleton with the uh, environment, which is labeled as mechanical effects. And in this talk, in, in my project, I'm going to focus on the transmission of the muscle force to the skeleton through the tendons. Uh, this is actually a very important problem because, uh, as is obvious to, to you, uh, the behavior of the muscle, its state and its force, is determined by the mechanical characteristics of the tendon. It's also true that the metabolic consumption of the muscles is determined by the tendon because this is a function of muscle force and state. So the hypothesis of this project was that the muscle tendon morphology of the human leg has evolved uh, to minimize the metabolic cost of walking at self-selected speed. So what I'm going to do throughout this project is look at uh, the uh, properties of tendons and see if I can use that to back out the metabolic cost of walking as well as the muscle force and state. So just a, a quick recap. Um, for any muscle in the leg or anywhere else in, in the body, there's a, a muscle, a tendon. Um, the tendon has some force length characteristics as shown by the equation on the top right. Uh, and what I want to do is I want to tune that equation for each tendon in the leg uh, so as to match the behavior of the human during walking. So this is the model I use. Uh, it's a very uh, kind of lumped model, muscle um, representation of the leg. There are uh, 12 muscles uh, and 12 tendons which I optimize. And, uh, I will explain what's on the left on the next slide, but in the interest of time, I'll just give you the flow chart here of what's, what's done. So as my title implied, it's a data-driven approach. So I take metabolic data, EMG data, motion capture data, force plate data, and I feed it into the system. So um, for the EMG data, I use it to estimate muscle activation, obviously. We use a hybrid estimator based on a Sanger's Bayesian algorithm, uh, and then a shaping filter after that to get activation. Uh, we use motion capture data, we plug in the SIM to get muscle tendon lengths, muscle tendon moment arms, and net joint torque. Um, all of this is fed into a uh, model uh, that reflects the figure I showed you on the previous slide, um, trying to, to m model the effects of each muscle in the leg. Um, that uh, model is then fed to a multi-objective optimization, which tries to simultaneously minimize metab the metabolic cost of walking and match the measured torque. Uh, for the ankle, the knee, and the hip joints. And this is in order to test the hypothesis and utilize the hypothesis that is then utilized back. So um, again, I'll have a poster on this, so this is probably not all clear from this quick presentation, but uh, the results are, are pretty interesting. So this is a, a plot of the results of those op the multi-objective optimization for five subjects. Uh, on the y-axis is a measure of the uh, fit to the kin kinetic data that was connected, collected. And on the x-axis is the metabolic cost of transport. Each dark gray shaded region is the uh, metabolic cost of transport for my full range of subjects, and each lightly shaded gray region is the specific um, subject in question. By looking at the metabolic budget of each muscle uh, in the model for each subject, we're able to determine an optimal solution for each subject, and it turns out that we are able to very nicely match the measured metabolic cost of walking in each case. So with this representation, with the estimated muscle activations, with the uh, estimated muscle tendon morphologies, we were able to look at um, muscle uh, force and muscle state. Um, another uh, interesting question that this, this type of approach can resolve is the 
uh, torque contribution of each muscle at, at the joint or leg, because obviously you can only measure the, the net torque. Uh, and so with this approach and the information gained from it, you're able to look and figure out what each muscle is doing, how it's contributing to the net joint torque. And that's what these slides here show. You're also able to look at muscle um, state, so the, the fascicle length um, and the fascicle velocity, and you're able to infer interesting things about that. For instance, you'll see in these plots, if you examine them closely, that there are long regions where the muscle is essentially isometric. That's known to be very efficient, and so it makes sense that you'd be seeing that throughout gait. But again, without properly taking into account the effect of tendons, you're not able to see these things. Um, and my last slide is just showing that there is some qualitative agreement with this with ultrasound studies, uh, but if you're here, more, you also look at my books here. Thank you. So, uh, our lab works primarily on developing uh, wearable robotic exoskeletons. And wearable robotic exoskeletons, as we all know, are designed to assist any range of functional and dynamic movement that humans might engage in, um, most typically walking and running. And the overall goal of these is often to reduce the metabolic demands of movement, but to date, there's no report of a portable wearable robotic device that can actually reduce that cost. Um, and we think that that's because the mechanics and energetics of exoskeleton interaction with underlying physiology are poorly understood. Um, so the motivations for what I'm presenting here today. Uh, we've done some human studies, we've done muscle level imaging, and we've been able to characterize the human neuromechanical um, interaction with a wearable robotic exoskeleton. And now these taught us a lot, but they're very time consuming and they're very narrow in scope. We really have to whittle down the questions we can ask with a preparation like this. Uh, we've also done some very simple forward modeling. And these modeling frameworks, they nicely predicted um, observed neuromechanics and energetics from human studies, um, but this Hill model of muscle contraction, it really leaves a lot to be desired. There's a lot of shortcomings in it that make the modeling approach useful, but only to a point. So what we've developed um, is a novel framework for integrating the inertial components of our forward modeling with actual biological muscle and tendon. Uh, so I'll walk you through this prep here a little bit. Uh, we actually remove the plantaris muscle and Achilles tendon from a bullfrog. Um, we submerge it in Ringer's solution, we oxygenate it, we can keep it alive. We keep the sciatic nerve intact and we interface directly with it. And we hook the muscle onto a feedback controlled ergometer. Um, this ergometer is being controlled by a computer that's simulating very simple inertial mechanics. It's simply a, a point mass um, in gravity with a fixed mechanical advantage. And we drive, we inject a feed-forward stimulation signal through the nerve to actually drive muscular contraction and get out functional neuromechanics, or at least that's what we hope we're doing. Um, and I should also mention that we tune the inertial parameters of our environment, our simulated environment, to actually mimic a human-like passive resonant frequency. Um, so really quickly, our experimental protocol, uh, we, first we perform a passive oscillation with our dynamic inertial load and get a passive frequency, res frequency response from our muscle. Next, we drive the system for six cycles of contraction in a randomly ordered range of frequencies, anywhere from plus or minus 30% of our resonant frequency. And we use the final three contractions in further analysis. Um, and so one of the big issues, as some of you are probably aware of the electrical stimulation, is fatigue. So we constantly are checking to make sure that we're getting greater than 80% of our observed peak force during a fixed-end contraction. Uh, as soon as we fall below that threshold, we assume that the muscle is no longer giving us a good representation relative to previous trials of its contraction capabilities. So we do have some current results from this. Uh, we are able to generate stable and cyclic muscle tendon unit mechanics. So I forgot to mention it, but we actually instrument our muscles with something called sonomicrometry, which is an implantable ultrasound system that gives us a real-time measurement of the muscle length, and we can decouple muscle and tendon mechanics. So what you see here is a work loop for three contractions at 2.6 hertz. Uh, red is our muscle, green is our muscle tendon unit, and blue is our tendon. And so you can see our muscles contracting, our tendon cycling a good amount of energy. Uh, so we're fairly confident that these nicely reflect the types of functional mechanics you would want to see during gait. Um, and using this approach, so far we've managed to reliably characterize the active frequency response of biological muscle and tendon under this dynamic inertial load. Now if you want to see that, you're going to have to come talk to me at my poster. Uh, there's not really time to present it here. But 
We do have some plans for some future studies, uh, which was the subject of the title of this talk, and what, which is an exoskeleton simulator. So, um, not only can we do this dynamic inertial environment, we can actually rapidly prototype any sort of actuation strategy we like and implement it and have it interact dynamically with this biological muscle and tendon, sort of skirting the need for a hill model. Uh, secondly, we would like to implement some kind of closed loop control. We have all the instrumentation in place to simulate spinal cord reflex. That includes measure real time measurements of force, length, and velocity. Um, and there's some interesting things that go along with trying to implement closed loop control, which again I'd be very happy to discuss at my poster later today. Um, but that's all I have for you now. Okay, well, the Two pictures here are because both Sam and I are, are here in, uh, in the conference, so if you have questions about the really difficult things, you can ask Sam, and if you want kind of general picture, you can always talk to me. Um, this, is a, this is a joint project with uh, Sam's advisor, Shankar Sastry, and uh, my former postdoc advisor, Dan Kodacek, uh, and I'm currently at University of Michigan. So I'm, I'm just going to talk about why you should come and, and talk to me next to my poster. I'm not going to talk about my results at all. Um, but I'm, I'm going to mention that I'm, I'm one of the people who work on these things, on things that have many legs. And so the specific topic I'm talking about matters only for creatures that have many legs. And so I'm going to show you some videos and ask you to try and figure out what's the common theme to these videos. Other than, of course, all of them having many legs. What are these animals all doing? Oh, yeah, you can, you can give an answer if you want, Steve. Well, so, so, so the common theme for, for all these, these animals that you're seeing here is that when they're stepping down, multiple legs are hitting the ground at once. And, and these are, this is the cockroach I worked on. The triangles show you legs that are in stance, and you kind of see that all of them going to stance almost instantaneously. Um, so, so I, I will I will argue that this should not be happening at all. Okay, so there there are really good reasons why we shouldn't see this. Uh, one good reason comes from work that Andy and and Manoj were here did a few years back, showing that you, you'd have less energy loss if you spaced foot touchdowns equally. So think of this as just a rimless wheel. Four legs, they're spaced equally. You bounce less up and down, you lose less energy in your collisions. Obviously, that's better. Um, and Andy will correct me if I'm misrepresenting him. Here's, an <laughs> okay. Here, here's another reason why this should not happen. If you look at a limit cycle, this sort of yellow thing in, in the state space, that's a one-dimensional object. Well. Um, each transition of hitting the ground is meeting a one-dimensional condition. So these two conditions together are co-dimension two. A one-dimensional object and a co-dimension two object should never meet. It's like two lines in space at random. They should never meet. We should never see this happening. Um, so generically, it, it should just not be. Um, here's another reason why this is, or I, I should say first, so why do we see these? Well, one reason we might see something that should generically not happen is because the phenomenon we're looking at is associated with some special kind of stability. So some states that normally do not look like that get pulled in to this configuration where multiple legs hit down at once. Um, so is there some special kind of stability that's associated just with that phenomenon of simultaneous touchdown or, or liftoff? Of course, if that happens, we're in trouble. Uh, David Remy, who's also here, has a paper showing that uh, if you look at, at a series elastic actuated quadruped, the results of the calculation of what happens with that quadruped vary discontinuously depending on the ordering of the footfalls. So if you take 
your front left and back right hitting together at once, you approach that limit with one of them leading and the other lagging. You approach that limit the other way around, you're going to get different results. So it's going to be really problematic. Um, and generically, if you have simultaneous transitions, they create in, in hybrid systems, they create sliding modes, they create what are called Zeno executions, and other problems that make understanding this flow very difficult. So, um, it turns out that that actually doesn't happen in the case that matters for locomotion. So, if in locomotion, there's an ambient flow that takes us right through all these transitions. All the legs eventually hit the ground every cycle. And that turns out to solve the problem, and if you want to know what happens, you'll have to come and see my poster. But the short version is that the fixed point, you have a new kind of stability that is really cool, it's robust against muscle and traction uncertainty. And so I think it should be interesting to the locomotion community. Thank you. So let's have a look at this jumping robot. So you see this robot is a is a, it's called bio biped. It's a jumping robot which has kind of features like muscles which have compliance and like a serial actuation. And at the moment you see the robot is jumping in a cage, so basically it's sliding in, the, in the, it's guided by the, by the mechanism. And of course the goal is to make this free. And in order to that I will present some work by Masia. And I also will like to point out another poster which is going to be presented today. So there's one poster on of Christian, who also cannot be here, unfortunately. And he investigated how the structure of the muscles in the leg can help to keep balance. So if you're jumping, if you're running, if you're walking, you need to keep balance. And for that, you have to, 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 to investigate how the muscle structure can contribute to negotiating directions of force during locomotion. And this is basically the key topic of Christian's poster. And the work of Masia I'm presenting here is to apply control strategies to prepare stance phases, so basically swing leg strategies, in order to achieve stable hopping and running. So, and for that, he compared different control approaches, starting with an approach from Raybert, where basically you have a velocity-dependent control of the leg angle, here described by the displacement of the leg with respect to center of mass and horizontal direction. And um, with this, he compared a different approach from Frank Volker, also from our group, uh, which was developed to uh, investigate stable running in 3D, and he was using this strategy for uh, leg placement, and the basic idea is here that you have a velocity vector and the gravity vector, and you define a ratio between the both, which is the mu value, and depending on the value, you can select the angle of attack. And the third strategy is here described, it's called velocity-based leg adjustment, and the difference too between the approach from Frank Polker and uh, from Mazier the new approach is that you're not taking just the orientation of the velocity into account, but also the vector. So basically you get a vector of the leg orientation, which is depending on the velocity vector, and the vector of the gravity, and these two vectors are now taken into account again by a ratio or a factor u. And I would like to show you the results. So first, I would like to show here results for stable running. And what you see here is the color is a ratio of the velocity of the initial velocity to the final velocity. It's just kind of like how efficient the running pattern is. And you see that there's a, a range of speeds you can obtain stable running. The blue area is actually where it's not stable. And then if you compare that with the Polka approach, that you can see that the region is much more homogeneous and it's also increasing the speed range, but still you have to adapt the parameters to the speed to match stable gait patterns. And if you now see the last step, which is a, a approach from Masia, you can see that we can even keep the control adjustment parameters constant for the for a large range of speeds, which is actually matching also the human running speeds. So what are the key insights? The key insight that you can come up with a design of a flex swing like control policy, which is uh, depending on the magnitude and the direction of the velocity. And compared to the other two approaches, we could and reaching the uh, region of stable running to all velocities from 3 to 11 meter per second, which are relevant for human running, and we don't have to adapt anything in the controller. And it's more robust with, against two perturbations and system perturbator variations. 
and also it converges faster, faster to stable in the climate. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Alexander. Um, I'm from APFL Switzerland. I'm going to show you our work on our quadruped robot, uh, specifically um, the influence of the active spine. Um, there's relatively, so first of all, if you look at animals, quadruped animals, mammalian quadruped animals who are bounding, um, they make significant use of the active spine motion. So instead of just stiffening the spine, and this is in the sagittal layer. And the reason for, so the obvious reason, the, the, the very early observed reason for this one is that you get much larger stride lengths. So up to four meters for a cheetah, which is about like a meter fifty long or so. So you have a significant win in, in speed eventually. Uh, in the robotic community, uh, you see relatively few robots, however, who actually have this implemented and, well, for, for, for multiple reasons, I guess. So the ones I know uh, is Boston, I mean, Boston Dynamics Cheetah and MIT Cheetah from Sang Bi Kim, if you're in the audience, uh, and now also Bobcat Robot. Um, and most of the other quadruped robots, which are on the scientific academic market, um, use um, control on leg angle and leg length instead. So they basically uh, omitted one of the degrees of freedom. And why are we interested in doing this one? Uh, we obviously also want to see the effect on, on speed, uh, but we are also interested in the effect of cost of transport and stability. And we would like to see uh, if, we can, if we can find certain sources. Um, so what do you need? Well, you need first a quadruped robot. So we designed Bobcat robot. It is a very small uh, quadruped robot, about one kilogram lightweight has uh, nine RC servo motors, but yeah, much in size. So really small. Um, second, you need control. So we're using uh, central pattern generators. Um, these are networks of coupled oscillators. Uh, we're using them in a feed-forward configuration. Um, and each of those nodes, color-coded, is applying position control on the RC servo motors. So what we basically do, we implement these coupled oscillators. And you see here, um, a set of them basically um, being co computed, co uh, compute. and here you saw a change. So we can we can at any point in time alter all the, the parameters and get um, all the advantages of uh, central pattern generators, like the self uh, so self synchronizing. They uh, smooth smoothly start. So what you saw here and here, um, the transients was what was here uh, can be smooth or non smooth depending on what you like to have, and especially important for our robot was that we can set all the parameters directly. So I, we define amplitudes and duty factors and frequencies. It's very easy. Uh, they're also hierarchical. What it reduces the number of parameters to tune. And potentially what we didn't use here, we can also use them um, to have a feedback control. So what do we do? We basically connect each of those um, mm -hmm. points here. So that's, that would be the standard configuration for a robot without a spine. But we added one of the oscillator nodes um, into the spine. And this oscillator node is then controlling also the uh, RC7 motor. So first of all, you see um, experimental results with a stiff spine. So you basically tuned um, the CPG parameters, which are about eight, I think, here. Um, so only the leg length and the leg angle parameters to get as fast as possible gates. And you get a, already from this one, you get a large variety of gates, in this case up to about three body lengths per second. So relatively fast to get flight phases. And the robot's a bit unstable, so it goes, goes like sideways every so often. It has also, because of its construction and instability to, to pitch. Um, now we see on the right side what happens if we make the same um, optimization, let's say, uh, with the active spine. Uh, with the active spine, you see clear flight phases. We could um, find much more stable gates, and we found also faster gates. OK, that's, that's all great. Um, but where does it come from? What is, what is underlying? So here we basically make the same experiment. We recorded um, ground reaction forces. We have the motion capture data. We have also high-speed uh, motion data. And then we look at the data. So first result, uh, significant result. If we integrate the horizontal force, the absolute of the horizontal force, and we look at the fixed spine, the result is high. Like here's a 0.6. If you do the same thing with the active spine, it's much, much lower. This is indicating we're basically with the active spine, although we are faster, we're actually reducing. Uh, we are Plus, we are not decelerating and accelerating as much. Um, that's, that's, a, that's an interesting result because on the other side, unfortunately, we are faster here with the active uh, one, but the electrical cost of transport is higher. So that, we think, is partially due to having one more motor in the system, which in our case is, is, is doing the job instead of some other configurations. So looking into having this active degree of freedom with, uh, with, uh, with the spring. 
Um, we also looked at all the other num numbers like collision angle, collision fraction. Uh, we recalculated everything into um, uh, fruit numbers also. The second interesting effect was the smaller pitching angle. So because every time just before impact, you see that the spine is bending downwards. And that was something what happened with the uh, fixed spine. Um, because it was fixed, we basically had every so often that the robot was just pitching over and became unstable forward. Um, so basically, the motion helped us to stabilize the robot. Uh, I would like to uh, just present my collaborators, uh, Emily and Alexandre, Madi and uh, Auke and Bobcat Robot. And uh, Madi is here in the audience. He's looking for a PhD. Great student. He's up there. So if you like to. So uh, hi, everyone. My name is Jun Tian Zhang, and my supervisor is Dr. Ching Wali. We're from uh, Queen's University of Canada. Um, first time being here at Dynamic Walking, so I was very happy to be here. Um, the main purpose of this research is to reduce the metabolic cost of human gait. And our approach to doing this was by attempting to reduce the mechanical cost of the step-to-step -step transition period. We focused on the step-to-step -step transition period because it was considered to be a major determinant of human gait. And uh, so in order to reduce the mechanical cost of step-to-step -step transition, we developed a passive interlimb device that facilitates mechanical energy transfer between the trailing and leading leg uh, at the step to step. So you see the figures there. Uh, they depict the basic illustration of the device, along with uh, someone who's wearing it in our testing facility. Um, so the both legs are joined together by an elastic cable, um, which runs through a set of pulleys, and which are then attached to commercially purchased feet harnesses that are worn over the subject's shoes. Um, the entire device is then mounted to a rigid backpack frame um, so that it can be worn by the subject. So one of the benefits of a very simple device is that the total weight of the device is approximately only one kilogram, and the elastic cable has an effective spring constant of approximately 81 newtons per meter. Um, the figure on the right shows basic the timing of the ma when maximum force occurs, and so that's in relation to the gate cycles, which are shown in the two graphs above. So the blue profile represents the right leg, and the red profile represent the left leg. Um, the human silhouette at the top is pretty common. You guys have probably all seen this before, um, but just shows standard events of the gait cycle with the shaded area representing the right side of the body. So in the step step transition period, um, which is highlighted in the gray region, that uh, the right leg is acting as the trailing leg, and the left leg is then the leading leg. So as you can see, energy is being absorbed from the leading leg um, at the end of swing to heel strike, and that energy is transferred to the trailing leg during the step-to-step -step period. Um, so the device essentially acts to assist um, in breaking or slowing down the swing leg and then assist in the trailing leg um, at push-off. Uh, for our methodology, we uh, measured the subject's metabolic and ground reaction force data uh, while walking on a treadmill at 1.2 meters per second under two walking conditions. Uh, the first one being walking with the device in active mode, and the second while walking with the device in passive mode. So in both uh, walking conditions, they are wearing the backpack, um, and in the active mode, the, essentially the elastics are attached to the subject's feet. Um, and of course, in passive mode, it's essentially just walking normally with the device um, with the additional weight of the backpack. Um, we then compute the average costs of transport for the metabolic rate and mechanical step-to-step -step transition cost. And so for the purpose of discussion, uh, we propose a, a question. Uh, is the step-to-step -step transition uh, a major determinant of human gait? And uh, if it is, then if we observe a difference in the step-to-step -step transition cost between the walking conditions, we should then also see a proportional difference in the metabolic cost as, as well. Um, however, if it's not, then we could end up with a scenario uh, on the right side where the mechanical cost of the step-to-step -step transition period does not change, yet still observe a change in the metabolic cost. So thank you very much. Uh, so please stop by my poster to see the results and for some discussion. Um, I also found out recently that we are hiring two, looking for two new faculty members. So if you're interested with that, you can stop by the poster and talk about that as well. All right, thank you very much. So when people walk at a preferred 
uh, when, when people walk normally, they end up with a preferred step width that ends up minimizing metabolic cost. Now, if you increase that step width, you end up increasing metabolic cost as well, and this is primarily due to collisions that are occurring. And if you want to minimize the cost due to these collisions, then you should go ahead and reduce your step width. But once you drop below your preferred step width and you start walking with narrow walking gates, you end up seeing an increase in metabolic cost as well. And the collisions don't do a good job of explaining why this is. So it's been proposed that circumduction could be responsible for this increase in um, metabolic cost as you get to narrower walking gates. And the idea here is that as your gate narrows, your stance leg ends up becoming an obstacle. And so you have to go ahead and swing your leg out and around that stance leg in order to maintain that narrow um, width. And that circumduction is what's going to be increasing metabolic cost. And so in this talk and in this work, we want to explore this a little bit more. So our hypothesis here is that circumduction does increase metabolic cost, and it's going to do this in a couple of ways. One, as you circumduct, you're going to go ahead and increase the motion of the swing leg, and that's going to take more active muscle work, and that's going to increase cost. Additionally, the increased motion from the swing leg is going to create a reaction torque over here at the stance leg, and so you're going to have to compensate somehow for that reaction torque, and that's also going to take additional work. So to go ahead and examine this hypothesis that the circumduction um, is going to, to, to increase cost, we ended up using constraints to modify circumduction. So instead of having folks walk with narrower and narrower step widths to get a broader range of circumduction, we used two constraints. We had the subjects maintain their step width at their preferred step width. And then we ended up using a series of shank obstacles to gradually increase the amount of circumduction that they were forced to walk with in order to maintain that preferred step width. So um, getting into our expectations just a little bit, we expect that the obstacles and lines are going to increase circumduction. And so now this increased circumduction is going to lead to greater stance leg torque, and it's also going to lead to greater arm motion to go ahead and compensate for the reaction torques that you're generating at the stance leg. So this combination of the increased swing leg motion and um, the, the body motion required to compensate for the torque is going to lead to increased metabolic cost. Jumping into the results, um, here is an image of the experimental setup uh, with the subject walking at the preferred step width with the obstacles in the um, smallest configuration. So this is the zero inch pin condition. And then over here on the, the left, we've got left and right. Um, and uh, we've got a top view of the midfoot trajectory during swing. So we've got left and right, and then we've got the step length here. And so as we increased the foam fins, we increased circumduction. And so now that we've got uh, in a broad range of circumduction, how did that affect some of these things that we were interested in looking in? Well, we saw a small increase in the stance leg moment. So over here on the right, I have a plot of circumduction versus the stance leg moment, the peak stance leg moment. And as circumduction increases, this is the peak circumduction that the subjects experienced while they were walking. We see the stance leg torque increasing, but maybe gradually. What we did see is we saw more arm motion in response to the um, uh, circumduction. So again, we've got circumduction and now plotted against the RMS of the linear acceleration of both of the arms. And then how did that contribute to metabolic cost? Well, like we expected, as circumduction increased, as those foams got bigger and bigger and you had more and more circumduction, it cost more and more to work. It cost more and more to walk. So to conclude, um, if you wanted to minimize the costs due to collisions, you should go ahead and walk with as small a step width as possible. But once you get too narrow, your stance leg ends up becoming an obstacle and you're going to have to start circumducting. So then the cost is going to go back up because you have to go ahead and swing that leg out around the stance leg and then you also have to compensate for these reaction torques that you're now generating at the stance leg. So what does this mean for a walking robot? Well, it would be great, again, if you could walk with zero step width, but since you can't, or if you, you, you can't get there, minimize leg circumduction, um, and then 
go ahead and think about using other parts of your robot, like your arms, to go ahead and compensate for that reaction torque. Thank you. All right, my name's Alay Ahmed. And uh, just a disclaimer, obviously this is a talk about arm reaching, um, but I hope that the results are going to, you find that it's immediately clear that this is relevant for locomotion research as well. So human movement is remarkably similar across individuals. And a prime example of such stereotypy is the conserved natural reaching speed observed among healthy young adults. And, uh, but however, movement speeds become slower with increasing age and with certain movement disorders such as Parkinson's disease. And we don't know why this is. So we need a better understanding of the mechanisms underlying the decision to move at a given speed. So a powerful approach to describing human movement is to frame it as an optimization problem. And a typical cost function will include an error term and an effort term and perhaps some other terms. But basically, you want to be as accurate and as lazy as you can. And the term for the effort cost is represented in arm reaching as the integral of the effort signal u squared uh, with respect to time, where the effort signal can be anything from a neural command signal to muscle activity to force or to the derivative of force. And importantly, this term has not been experimentally validated in arm reaching movements. It's simply mathematically convenient and has done a good job of predicting naturalistic movements. But can this effort term alone explain how fast I should reach for this cup of coffee? In other words, will it predict a metabolically optimal reaching speed? And the short answer is no. According to this term, the model would predict that the metabolically optimal speed is zero. So to minimize effort, I should reach really, 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 really slowly. So interestingly, in human locomotion, it's generally accepted that metabolic cost is a major determinant of the choice to walk at a given speed. And this is largely because actual metabolic cost has been measured, and there is a metabolically optimal walking speed. So this is in direct contrast to the predictions of the arm reaching models, which predict a metabolically optimal speed of zero, but don't have any metabolic data to back up that prediction. So we thought, Let's measure metabolic cost during reaching movements and determine whether there is a reaching speed that minimizes metabolic cost. And we had two primary questions. One, can we measure differences in actual metabolic cost with increasing reaching speeds? Because these are probably small differences. And two, if we can, can metabolic cost explain why people reach at a given speed? To test this, we had eight subjects hold the handle of a manipulandum and make 20 centimeter reaching movements. And the handle controlled a cursor on the screen, and subjects had to move the cursor from a home circle to a target circle. And we measured their metabolic cost as they reached at six prescribed speeds. Uh, very slow, slow, um, medium, fast, very fast, and preferred. We also met, well, clearly we measured their rates of oxygen consumption and carbon <coughs> dioxide production and converted that to net metabolic power using standard methods. To investigate our first question, we tested the hypothesis that metabolic power will increase with faster reaching speeds. Uh, here are the results. So we observed, so on, on the y-axis is metabolic power, on the x is average speed, and we observed that as subjects reached faster and faster, their metabolic power increased significantly. Okay. So yes, metabolic power increased with faster reaching speeds, and we can measure these differences. On to the main question, can metabolic cost explain why people reach at a given speed? Here we tested the hypothesis that there exists a, um, an optimal speed that minimizes metabolic cost per movement. So we calculated net cost per movement by multiplying net metabolic power by movement time. And the results show that at low speeds, the cost per movement is relatively high. And as subjects reach faster, this cost decreased. But at faster speeds, this cost began to increase again, creating a U-shaped curve. So yes, there is an optimal speed that minimizes cost per movement, which means that metabolic costs can explain why people reach at a given speed. And we confirmed these same findings in two other groups of subjects that reached at 10 centimeters and at 30 centimeters. So what's the significance? So first, we've demonstrated that we can measure differences in small differences in metabolic cost in these controlled reaching tasks, which opens the door for precise and focused studies that improve our understanding of the costs and constraints underlying movement decisions. 
Secondly, we found that there is a metabolically optimal reaching speed, which suggests that current representations of effort and computational models may need to be revised. And finally, we didn't want to, I didn't want to spill all the beans, so there are two remaining questions. So for example, why is there a metabolically optimal speed? How can we model this? And secondly, metabolic cost can explain preferred reaching speed, but does it? And so to find out the answer to those questions, you have to come see the poster. I show you the sign. Yeah. Okay, so the next is Jessica Selinger talking about estimating metabolic cost during non steady state walking. And other animals move in a way that minimizes metabolic cost. This is a central and unifying principle of locomotion, and it's featured predominantly in much of the work that's been presented here today. Now, given the importance that we place on this measure, consider for a moment how we actually measure energetic cost. By measuring oxygen consumption at the mouth, we can estimate the muscle energy use from contracting muscles. So, this is metabolic power data that was collected over the course of about 70 minutes of walking. Now, the issue is, is that this respiratory measure is a delayed and noisy representation of the underlying muscle energy use. And so to overcome these issues, we typically follow two processing rules. First, we get rid of any data that's collected during or near after a change in gait. So basically, we throw out anything dynamic. Then, to overcome these noise issues, we average over long bouts of steady state walking. Now, I started with over an hour's worth of metabolic power data, and I now have about 10 data points. What we're interested in is whether or not there is retrievable and relevant information in the other 1,000 data points that I started with. Perhaps the most interesting information that can be gained from metabolic cost data occurs during non-steady state walking. This seems particularly likely given that we rarely encounter steady state conditions in the real world. This figure, courtesy of Orendorf and colleagues, illustrates exactly that. Our walking bouts typically last about 20 seconds. If we start walking, only about 1% of the time will we continue walking for a time that is long enough over which we typically measure metabolic cost. So if we think about that for a second, if we only assess steady state metabolic cost, then we're basically focusing all of our efforts on the 1% case. When we move in the world, we are continually changing and adapting our gait. By restricting ourselves to steady state metabolic costs, we're essentially restraining the research questions that we can effectively answer. And so the purpose of this work is to try to estimate metabolic costs during non-steady state walking. Now, at a really high level, the approach that we use to do this is we first tried to <clears throat> enforce some known input in muscle energetics. And we did this by ascribing walking speed, um, <clears throat> walking speed and step frequency. We then measured the response and metabolic cost. Now, given these known inputs and, and measured outputs, I then model this person as some dynamic system that maps um, muscle energetics to measured metabolic cost. Now, if I have some model that lets me go from my input to my output, then our next thought is that we should be able to take this model and using the inverse of it, go from my output to my input. So we should be able to measure metabolic cost and come up with some estimate of muscle energetics. And that's what we tried to do. So here's an example of metabolic power data that was collected during three walking trials. I take this data, I'm running it through the inverse of my model, and I produce three very different and distinctly non-steady state estimates of muscle energetics. What's more is if I compare these profiles to my enforced muscle energetics, which you can try to see here, you can see that the model is working quite well. So just to reiterate, we're starting out with three metabolic power profiles that really don't look all that different from one another. 
we run it through the inverse of our model, and without any prior information about what that input looked like, we're generating fairly accurate estimates of muscle energetics. Um, our motivation for this study is to um, quantify metabolic cost throughout the course of locomotor adaptation and learning. Uh, I know many of you here are interested and quite well versed in that topic, so I look forward to discussing uh, this project in more details during the poster session. Thank you. Okay. People who are suffering a stroke or other neurological injury um, experience sleep deficiencies. Effective, re uh, effective rehabilitation techniques require patients actively use and engage their affected limbs. Manual assistive therapy, though effective, is expensive and typically strenuous on therapists. Current robotic weight trainers fail to uh, achieve useful levels of active engagement. So we want to develop a new robotic rehabilitation tool that uh, naturally results in active use of the affected limb while maximizing rehabilitation outcomes. So our idea is to utilize strength of robotic devices to try to incentivize desirable gait patterns. So shown here is a hypothetical cost landscape for normal walking with muscle activity on the x-axis and metabolic cost on the y-axis. And people tend to adopt muscle activity patterns that minimize their overall energetic cost. But effective gait rehabilitation requires people to increase use of the muscles in the near affected limb. But just forcing people to increase this use may result in an increase in metabolic cost and go against natural tendencies. So assistive devices can make walking more energetically efficient over a wide range of different muscle activity levels. And although the minimum of these pairs may lie at a slightly lower muscle activity level than normal, if we follow the curve along, there may exist a point where walking with increased muscle use and full assistance from the device is actually more metabolically efficient than their normal optimal operating point. So we can see this gradient in metabolic cost as we increase muscle use. So our idea is to manipulate the cost landscape such that a new minimum exists at a gait with increased muscle use, and we want to see if people can actually tend to self-select that new optimum. So we first ran an experiment uh, to see if people, if we could actually manipulate the cost landscape itself and make increased walking with increased muscle activity more energetically efficient. So we had subjects walk on a treadmill at 1.35 meters per second and had an assistive device on their right leg and we measured cancer flexor muscle activity of the left leg. We enforced certain muscle activity levels by um, providing visual feedback of their muscle activity on each step and um, then a target that they were trying to strive for. And over the experiment, we varied two parameters. The first was the device assistance, which is either off or on, and the second was the target level of muscle activity, which is either normal or increased, and we ran all four combinations of these. So shown here are results for six subjects, and on the uh, x-axis is the percent muscle activity above the no assistance plus normal muscle activity condition, and on the y-axis is the net metabolic rate above this nominal. And we assume that these points lie on our hypothetical curve. And the points of most interest were the no assistance with normal muscle activity condition and the full assistance with increased muscle activity condition. And we see on average that people walking with increased muscle activity plus assistance from this exoskeleton is actually more energetically efficient than uh, walking with no assistance and normal muscle activity. So we do see this uh, trend or gradient descent in metabolic rate as we increase uh, and, uh, muscle activity. So we then uh, wanted to put this into a new cost landscape. So we developed a controller that varied the level of assistance provided by the device proportionally to the increase in muscle activity above baseline. And uh, we wanted to see if people would naturally increase their muscle use. And we found that people really didn't. So we said, all right, well, why don't we make the gradient as steep as we possibly can and have a step change in assistance? So if people's muscle activity is at or below baseline, we provided no assistance. And if it was above baseline, we provided full assistance from the device. And still, people didn't really choose to increase their muscle activity and walk at this new minimum. Uh, shown here is just a time series of their muscle activity um, over time. And the black line is baseline. And you can see that the average of this is really around still the baseline level. However, if we reverse the system, so we said, let's give full assistance for a reduction in muscle activity below uh, the baseline. Then a uh, pilot study showed that people actually do reduce their muscle activity below this baseline and, and tend to that new minimum. So the question kind of becomes, what's really affecting this interaction? Uh, do people really minimize energy costs? Is that what they're minimizing? Or do people just not have enough training or coaching um, and just need more time? Is the interaction
action that's going on just too complex for them to realize. Uh, or maybe people are seeing the device as just a complete externality that they have no control over, and um, they're just responding to it rather than noticing that they're in control of it. Thank you.